Campbell, a space to debate, study and celebrate architecture. Tonight, we are very happy to have uh, here uh, Paola Pellier, uh, Anna uh, Pellier, uh, uh, they are uh, Portuguese, very young uh, architects from Porto, uh, but in, even if they are very young, about 28, 27, 30, <laughs> no, 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 28. Not 28. Yet. Uh, they already uh, had a great success. I mean, they are here because, because on Monday they will present their own work, the work of the office at uh, La Casa dell'Architettura. And I would like also to thank Luca that told us, but why don't uh, <laughs> have uh, Fala also in Campo uh, before? And uh, tonight they will not uh, talk about the, the, the work of the office, but about an experience they had uh, three years ago, three. more or less, uh, in Tokyo. They spent one year in this building, uh, and they have a, a, a great story about this building, because they, uh, Felipe was uh, telling me before that they had been the first not Japanese people who lived inside this, uh, this, this building. Uh, which has a great story and probably an unknown future. Uh, and so it would be uh, very interesting to know uh, from, from them uh, this story. Thank you so much to be here and okay. welcome to that talk. Oh, hello. And we are the ones who thank you for the. Huh? We got it. Yes, yes, yes. So it's easier to talk. Hello. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's it's very pleasant to come to come to Rome and to see on a Saturday evening a room so full. Uh, yes, we were we were very lucky because three years ago we were living in 1.5 square meters. This is not it's not an exaggeration. We were living in a cabinet in Tokyo, and. Uh, we were looking for another place to, to move to, and by chance, in a late afternoon, we took the wrong metro, we, you know, we got lost, and we, we ended up... We arrived late at to, in our architectural tour around Tokyo, and we arrived at night, and we tried to get in, and in Japan, people are very complicated, and we were lucky enough to have one of the two persons that speak English in that building coming down. And we, by chance, just just met him and uh, we ended up living in the building. But before talking about the night again, we need, to, we need to create a context. We need to say something about, uh, uh, about how this building came to happen. And unfortunately, the light is not ideal, but this is supposed to be a print screen from Google Maps from Japan. And from this Tokyo. from Tokyo. So this is this is a house, and the image would show that there's basically no empty space at all. And um, the next one? well, and the next one was a zoom in of the same image, where you can would be un able to understand that Tokyo is an island with a lot of mountains and uh, almost no free space. So the cities are extremely dense. Most of the construction is not quite high. It's actually it's actually very low. Uh, you have almost 75% of the construction with two levels or less. So this means that in big cities you would imagine uh, a construction to be taking less space in plan and more in height. But actually in Japan the construction is very low and spread. If you overlap this with the fact that you have very little available land, this starts creating... Uh, this is the beginning of a problem. Um, and if you go to Tokyo's town hall and you just look at the horizon, the city doesn't end. You or don't if have. If you go to any tall building in Tokyo, if you take a plane, if you take a plane, you will see city and city and city and city, and you don't. You never have. Uh, you know, like when you have a crossing of two highways, you usually have empty spaces. You don't have that in Japan. You have more houses, more city, more buildings. So, this has been a problem in Japan for a long, long time. The population has grown uh, exponentially in the last 100 years. 
uh, of course, with the Kanto earthquake and with the with the world wars, there were moments of you know opposite uh, with the opposite movement. But in, in in the last 100 years, the population in Japan grew dramat uh, dramatically. So there is no free space, and this uh, this problem. Uh, can be seen in Tokyo uh, in different kinds of areas. You can see moments where you have a more or less homogeneous group of housing blocks. So this is uh, uh, these are apartment buildings with six, seven levels. You can have offices. You can have a more or less, uh, let's call it normal city. But you also have other areas like this, which are much more common, and they take a biggest, the biggest percentage of the land in Japan, where you have single-family houses side by side, and all of them are actually very small. You know, a type 2 or a type 3, they can be below 30, 25 square meters. So you have a lot of space, but all of it is taken. And, uh, and sometimes these two, they clash, and you have a mixture of uh, these areas where you have tall buildings, single-family houses and a cemetery, all of them overlapping because the space is so short that, you know, the houses just took the space that was around the cemetery. There's no, no, no buffer zones. There's no, no clear... Uh, I mean, there, there are very clear limits between the properties. Usually you would, ha you would have uh, a brick wall separating the property, but all of it is taken. So the idea of a garden is replaced by the idea of a potted plant. The idea of uh, a sidewalk is replaced by a line on the asphalt so that you don't lose space with the difference of heights of sidewalks and the cars can move through. So it's very, very, very dense. And this is a very common thing to find. So uh, real estate agencies in Japan, they are, they are small. They are not big companies. You don't have Remax or anything like that. You usually have small stores in a neighborhood where you can go there and advertise your, your apartment. And the image is not ideal, but for example, this is a typical plan of an apartment where you have a living room that is probably 10 square meters, a bedroom that is maybe 6 to 8, and this is a, a family apartment. You and your wife move in and you live in 22, 23 square meters. This is a very, very common normal area. Uh, and this tells us that Japan, uh, this, is, this tells us something about efficiency. Like they understand that they have little space, they understand that they have big amounts of people, so the first conclusion is we reduce the amount of space per person. Um, they are also quite sensitive. Uh, uh, there's a contrast in Japan. So they are very rational in the way they organize their own city. Uh, but then Philip was saying that in the city there are no buffer zones. But in the city, there are huge parks, for example, and huge uh, areas with, uh, with trees. But you cannot find one single tree in the middle of a few houses. So that's the difference. But when you get these spaces, they get very... Um, uh, uh, not uh, temple-like, like religious, and it's a, di a completely different ambience than you get from the rest of the city. And... And at the same time, they lived a lot the changes in the seasons. And they all have a very, very boring life, working from 9 to uh, midnight probably, and uh, seven days a week. But then there's these specific moments that happen uh, that are usually related to more important things, that, for example, when the cherry blossoms uh, start, they all go and have picnics under the trees. Even, and at the same time, this is not a very full place under the trees because this is probably not the best spot, but you see how many people go there. So they have this based ideas that says, okay, now we can enjoy life. So it's at this moment in that place and they all go there and they all try to enjoy life. So they are a very, they are not European, they are not American, they are not Asian also. They are something else, something different. Um, um, but and this is also reflected in since they are born, they until they get three, they go to school and they are all uh, starting to dress exactly the same way. Uh, these are probably probably twelve year old kids 
dressed exactly as the 40 year old man sitting to next to them so they are very f uh, formatted. formatted I don't know if this word exists yeah. um, society uh, and they have convenient so the problem of the city of Tokyo is that it's so dense that you don't have space enough space to have big houses. If you don't have big houses, you don't have space to cook at home. So if you don't have space to cook at home, you need to have everything outside the, your apartment. So you have a convenience store every 15, 15 meters. meters, almost, every door. And they have a little bit of everything, even shirts or uh, food or all the basic things that you can even imagine that if you would need it. Um, they have restaurants everywhere, so they can leave the city very well, and they have these formats that are repeated everywhere. And the city, the city is able to absorb the whole country at once, if you close the borders. If you have no tourists in Japan, and you have a lot of them, they say that in average there's one million tourists in Japan every second. So if you have none of these tourists, the country will not even notice that they left. Because you go to restaurants and you have Japanese people. You go to supermarkets and you have Japanese. You, you go, go to the to touristic tourists. attractions. You have Japanese people. Japanese travel inside Japan. And this is fascinating because your feeling when you see a tourist in Japan, and although there are a lot of them, you don't see them that often, is somehow of, you know, you see one and you almost point at him. Like, well, there's a tourist there. And you have this capacity that the city, you know, the city is able to provide you food, convenience stores, uh, fun, leisure, bookshops, 24-7, 24 hours a day. Uh, I mean, why, why cook at home? You know, most ca mo the capsule is... it's cheaper to eat outside than to buy things and cook at home. The capsule is not even the best example because it's a very small space, but even in a 25 square meters apartment, this is your kitchen. It's probably 60 by one meter. You have a very, very small hoop, um, hop, and you have a very small sink, and that's it. And that's mostly for small meals because it's expected that at lunchtime you are at work, so you probably go out, eat something, and you come back. And at Pro dinner time you're probably still at work. Yeah, that's also <laughs> true. So you don't you don't have that much time. And until you turn 75, this is your routine. So it's more important to have 10 million of these convenience stores in the country than a few million supermarkets. But they still exist. And Japan, although not being what we could consider a very Asian country, it is still part of Asia, so there's a, a, certain, a certain identity and a certain amount of spaces that reflect a more uh, open-minded and less organized uh, Yeah, You, you probably all heard about crazy stories about crazy Japanese, and that's true, but it's not a rule. But you can find those exceptions, even in supermarkets, even in some... But usually you need to go to some specific areas. They are not... Uh, the main uh, they're not the they rule. are not the rule they are the exceptions and Japan is so amazing that you are forced almost literally to work seven days a week if you work in a big architecture office it's common that you work 12, 14, 16 hours a day you cannot leave if the boss is there and usually the boss is there a lot of times so you cannot leave almost any time but it's okay if you sleep in your workspace so you just, you know, I'm tired my boss is here, I cannot leave, I just sleep. That's it. You can be on Facebook, you can be just, you know, playing you Candy Crush Saga. You can sleep the whole day. You can sleep and the whole day fine. in your workplace, but you don't leave at any moment, your workspace. <laughs> so they are very, very organized, but let's be honest, they are not efficient. They are not as productive as they could be. And a little bit of Sofia Coppola. Japan, Japan is in that sense, it's, it's a magical place. I mean, we lived there one year and something, uh, and it, it changes you, it changes the way how you perceive a society because if you are there for two weeks, you're a tourist, you see everything is amazing, <laughs> everything is outstanding, everything is, is cute and kawaii, but you're still a tourist, you're not part of the machine that Japan actually is. But if you stay there long enough and you become part of the machine, you develop a routine, you are part of an office, you, you are forced to run to catch the train, you are forced to run to catch the metro, and you start, you know, you become part of a bigger organism, you start understanding a lot of other things about the country that usually a tourist would not would not get, and and all of these things start uh, with key historical key historical moments. So all these 
convenience stores, supermarkets, you know, the size of the apartments, they are not just uh, a reaction to the lack of space they have. They are a reaction to a series of conditions, historical, geographical, natural, that proved to happen in the past more often than, than they would want, that made the whole country need to adapt. So they cannot just ignore the fact that in 1923... No, but the thing is, before, it's, it was important for us to explain you how Tokyo works for you to understand why this building existed. And to explain why this building existed, we needed to explain Tokyo, and we need to explain how Tokyo s not started, but restarted. And probably this would be the time. So, so in 1923, there was the Kanto earthquake. And you can imagine the Tokyo, biggest. the biggest earthquake in history of Japan. And you can imagine it was, Tokyo had not as many people as it has now, but the buildings are also even lower than they are now, so it was even more spread. And the earthquake killed millions, destroyed the whole city. So there it was a, a tabula rasa. So the whole city went down at once, and millions and millions and millions of people had nowhere to go to. And in 1945, the Americans bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and for the second time in about 20 years, entire cities were decimated, and there was a need for massive housing for solutions of, not, not just housing, for cities, because nothing remained. So in 20 years, they had two very, very extreme experiences of the tabula rasa in entire cities that needed to be solved. Something that we don't have in Portugal. Uh, in Portugal, in, We don't have in Portugal, we don't have in Italy, we don't have in Europe. We have, especially in Rome, buildings from uh, with thousands of years. In Japan, that doesn't exist. Not even the old temples. The old temples are rebuilt every 20 years with the same wood pieces. Not the same, but the exact same uh, shape. So this thing of buildings to last forever that's something that doesn't exist at all in Japan, and it's part of their culture, and it's and all these events um, made this culture exist. And in 1960, a very talented group of architects, led by Kenzo Tange, uh, you have uh, Kanazoe, you have Kurukawa, you have Kikutake here in the corner. Uh, Isozaki joined later. Um, the other Pritzker guy, uh, Fumi Kumaki, also joined later. They came together and they decided to address this topic. They, I mean, these were the 60s, so this was the time for the crazy uh, utopian uh, architecture groups. And they decided that the problem was not anymore how to build. The problem was not how to solve an issue regarding numbers. The problem was how to build a whole city at once. If there was another bombing, if there was another earthquake, if there was another natural disaster, how could they, how could they react? How could they give an actual response to such a catastrophe? And they released the manifesto. Actually, they started working a little bit before in 1957, but in 1960 there was the World Design Conference and for the first time they came together as a team. They gave a name to themselves, the Metabolists. They wrote a manifesto and they presented a series of uh, at the time, not projects, but ideas on how the future of Japan would, uh, would change, which future was ahead of them. And uh, this was one of the projects for, this is Tokyo, this is Chiba, and this is the, the, the Tokyo Bay. And one of the problems was we don't have enough land, but we have a lot of sea, so we need to build in the sea. And this is not the first project where they did it. Kikutake did the same thing in the Marina City three years before. And what is even more amazing about this project is not the crazy idea that we're going to build over the sea. I mean, in the 60s, we, imagine it today, how crazy it is. Think about it 50 years ago. The most amazing thing about this image is that this is a print screen of a TV show. So for the first time ever in Japan, architects had media attention, and in prime time, when the whole family would come together to talk about, uh, to, sorry, to watch the news, this guy that no one knew at the time, Kenzo Tange, shows up on national television telling them, we need to build in the sea, we need to expand our land, we need to grow, we don't have enough land. So imagine, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, eight-year-old, you start hearing these ideas from very, very soon, and you never saw Nagasaki, you never saw the Kanto earthquake, but you hear that this is the future, you need to do it. And what is even more ironic, just a jump uh, in the future is that today 
this third of the Tokyo Bay is completely built. So it's not the kind of project can, that Kenzo Tange was proposing, but all of it is already construction. They gained land, not gained, I would say. They conquered. They conquered uh, the sea. They, they built gigantic <clears throat> platforms. And the only thing that happened is that all of this is now conquered to the sea. All of this is now housing for Tokyo. And when we were, we were there last summer, and they keep expanding and expanding. So it's true that the project is not the same, but the idea is exactly the same. And the principles are the there. principle is the same, and the fact that these guys were crazy enough to propose it, 50 years later, is finally having a, a consequence. Of course, they were not. This is not what was built, but this is a project from Isosaki, and what they were telling us is that you know the land is occupied. You cannot just do what the Americans did. You cannot just throw a bomb and clean the land. You need to accept that the land is there, and you cannot take everyone out. So we need to go up. We need to build structures that have the minimum amount of um, uh, connection to the ground. This connection needs to be extremely resistant in case of an earthquake. And we need to make it flexible. So today we have, they prepared these capsules for the internet in the 60s, in the 70s. They were thinking about the internet. Not the internet as we know it today, but something that was going to be like the internet. And all of these capsules were flexible because, you know, families grow, families also shrink. Uh, at the time they had telephones and TVs, but in the future there would be VHSs, DVDs, and internets. I mean, they didn't know it, but they expected it. And you needed to be able to adapt. You needed to be able to just uh, understand that the conditions were changing, and as they change, your space changes, your capsule changes. And by doing this, this kind of uh, uh, utopian and uh, uh, prefabricated systems, they would allow the city below to remain its, with its identity, and the more you would need to grow, you see some of this has already two levels of, uh, uh, I don't even know how to call this, but these structures could go and grow endlessly. So you would focus all the vertical circulation, and then you would have very small horizontal... The uh, idea was to have independent organisms uh, as housing. And then in the 70s, they had the so they were proposing all these crazy um, projects, either um, almost flying uh, housing systems or uh, building in sea. Uh, but in the seventies, um, they got the commission to organize the Expo Osaka. In the late sixties, sorry. The late sixties, sorry. They uh, they got the commission to organize in two years Expo Osaka. Um, and they took this as their manifesto. They all built something in, in the expo. Uh, it was one of the biggest events. Uh, Until Expo Shanghai, yes, it was the most was visited the expo ever. So in 30 years, uh, in 40 years, I mean, no one had more visitors than Expo Osaka. And in the in Expo Osaka, they took the opportunity to show all these uh, ideas that they have. This is a huge. Uh, structure with hanging um, capsules proposing to how these crazy ideas could actually be uh, produced and used and they called realize. and they called everyone I mean at the time you know they you know Ryanair was not the thing and this was Japan so not, not even but they call Giancarlo Di Carlo they call Jonah Friedman they call Hans Olein I mean they took all the big names in Europe to Japan so that they could show them and they could, you know, not only they could bring something else to the discussion, they could allow, you know, the metabolists to expand their field of knowledge, but also they could send to Europe the message that Japan is it's reinventing growing. itself, is adapting to, uh, I mean, this is a Japan that is under American control, this is a Japan that is not the super, put, uh, the super country you know today. This is a Japan that is uh, recovering his, his own pride after the defeat on the Second World War. And in 1970, this event was amazing because they spent 10 years between their manifesto and the Expo Osaka producing hundreds of utopian projects, hundreds of cities, hundreds of pod-like structures. None was built. Until 1970, not a single of these projects had any consequence. Not at this scale, not at that scale, nothing. And the Expo Osaka was a kind of, uh, you know, free opportunity to just show the world that this is possible, both from a technical point of view. This structure was outrageously big. 
If you have the chance to go to Osaka, to the park where it happened, you have just a piece that is this size, that is bigger than, you know, it's, it's gigantic. So there, there were capsules everywhere. There were robots, you know, like robots would serve drinks. I mean, they were just showing the world that this is the future. And it's not by chance that today you have Japan producing uh, cameras, uh, technology. I mean, this made an impact. But the Expo Osaka was a, a kind of ex libris. The, these guys, they were together for 10 years. They were becoming famous architects because in parallel to this movement, they were building museums, they were building schools, they were building town halls, all out of concrete. They were brutalist architects in reality. And they were just building gigantic structures all over the country. And then they were preaching metabolist super cities. So they knew that deep down, it was not really possible. They wanted to change the world, but they knew that the world was not ready to change that much. And all of these capsule projects, this is, one of, this is the project for the, the capsules in the Nakagin, had the same principle. You would have a small pod, the pod would be complete, you have a bathroom, so there's a central bathroom space with a toilet, a sink and a shower, not a shower, a bathtub. The bath is a very important thing in Japanese culture. You would have storage space, natural um, AC unit, so you could heat it or uh, refresh the space if you wanted. All this storage space would be flexible so that you could have a workspace but you could take it out. You would have clock, radio, internet connection that they didn't know exactly what it was but they left space for all the new potential connections to be added and a single bed. This was supposed to house only one person in each capsule. Uh, and although this is the Nakagin prototype, most of the other prototypes for the other projects were, were more or less following the same structure. And um, and in 1972, so the metabolists were already split. So they, they accepted after the Expo Zach, after you go that high, if you cannot give a consequence to, to your projects, each one goes in his own way. But in 1972, the Nakagin Corporation had an amazing idea. Uh, they wanted to revolutionize the housing market in Japan, but not from a, a political point of view like the metabolists, but from a let's call it graphical point of view. They want to take the imagery that the metabolists created and tell the world this is actually possible, but not because they wanted a better uh, ending for Japanese society, but because they really wanted to sell. And Japanese, they are a very, uh, how do you say, consumist? Uh, consumist? Uh, consumerist. Consumerist society. So they invited the media, uh, the media boy, Kishu Kurokawa, the youngest of the metabolists, the guy who loved newspapers and TV stations more than anyone else, to do a project. He was super famous. He was a star. He was 30 at the time, but he was a superstar. And they asked him, we have a company, we have uh, 140 workers, and we want you to build a building in front of our office building where we can house all of our workers. So and it should be... Then the new face of the company. So the name Nakajin actually comes from the name of a real estate agency, basically. And, uh, and, and this, promoters. And this building became just that. It was supposed to be a facade. It was supposed to hide. Actually, you will see in one of the photos that the building continues in the back, although I would say 99% of the architects have no idea about it. Even we, it took us three months living there to find out that actually the building was even bigger than we expected. And... Um, and this was it, 1972. The metabolists were out, they were over, and Kishu Kurokawa had the amazing opportunity to do the first and only metabolist project. And on a much smaller scale than the projects that they were proposing. So in terms of proportion regarding what they were, were proposing, this was almost a joke. And, but it had the image that they wanted. And that's the only part that the, the Nakagin Corporation wanted, which was the image that they got. But, um, but it, became the, it became the only building uh, from uh, the metabolism movement that standed. And that made it a very important uh, building itself. And when it was built, you can see that it was standing alone. It was it. It was... Um, this is a very important access in Tokyo, so this is a kind of uh, highway, elevated, highway. elevated highway that goes all over Tokyo, and you can imagine in the, the amount of traffic it would have, and, and this was standing alone. 
And as you can see, this was by far the tallest building in the block. But today, not so much. <laughs> so 40, these pictures are from 2013 and 2012. Uh, but as you can see today, other names, so, and as you can see until now, we only talked about Japanese names. In Japan, Japanese architects would build. Today, you have Jean Nouvel, Norman Foster, Richard Rogers, on the other side of the street. And if you keep walking, you have Toyoito and other European, uh, well, Toyoito is Japanese, but you have other European architects building uh, in, this, in this area. And clearly, the tallest building in the block is not the tallest anymore. And actually, it became just one more. It's not a... So this picture is taken from the last floor of one of the buildings in front. So you can see how tiny and insignificant it gets right now. And the Nakagin building is actually this. So this is what everyone knows, and this is the Nakagin Corporation. So it's the building of behind it. Normal offices. Um, so the building still has, you know, Visually, we can assume that the Nakagin Corporation was quite successful. The image is very strong. I think it's, it's the kind of image you can sell as a promoter. You can sell in Japan for sure. Japanese uh, were in love with it. The, the building became, a, how do you say, a kind of cockroach. Uh, well, it became very famous very, very fast. The media loved it. The apartments were supposed to house the workers from the Nakagin. Which was okay, but at some point the Nakagin they start selling each each, um, each unit, and from the one hundred and thirty-two, now there's like one hundred owners. Which so. creates a problem because you can imagine when there's a condominium meeting, one hundred people saying what they want to do with the building. It's quite complicated. And in it, Japan, if you don't have one hundred percent agreement on what to do, you do nothing. So you and can it's imagine. It's very important to understand where this building is located. So two streets after, it's Ginza, the most expensive square meter, not in the world anymore, but it used to be the most expensive square meter. So this building is in a, one of the most important areas of Tokyo, and it's occupying, it's not as efficient as they want it to be. And that's a problem that is that now it's starting to appear. It's not tall enough. The volume, you see, you, you're not using the maximum volume you can. And in Japan, it's not about the amount of square meters. Uh, I mean, it's not about the amount of apartments you get, but it's about the amount of square meters and cubic meters you get. And this is a very inefficient very volume. And as you can see, coming back to the metabolists, you notice on those dystopian models and projects that they always look a little bit uh, metabolist, you know, they look like an organism that just grew wildly. And you look at this building and it feels exactly the same. And Kurukawa wrote in 1972, the different owners are going to choose where they want to turn their capsule and if they want the window on the side or in the front and so on, so on, so on. And you look at it and it's actually like that. But well, Kurukawa just did this building as a sculpture because no one shows anything. It was just Kurukawa making it look like what it should look like. So it's in that sense also not very, very honest. And it's very important to understand that this project, since the moment that it was commissioned until it was built, four months. No, six. No, four months. Four months, okay. Four so. months. And <laughs> <laughs> um, to do the project and to build it. So it had, it, it was a very fast project and now you can see the problems that the project that didn't have the time to maturate and to understand all the uh, issues. Uh, brings later. Um, so the Nakagin, in the same way that the metabolism, the metabolism movement was thinking that the city should regenerate, so the idea of uh, the architect was to, every 20 years, they would remove the capsules and they would replace the capsules for newer ones with all the new technology that, w uh, that would be available. The problem is that it never happened. And the way it was built, you cannot remove one capsule. They are all standing in on top of each other. So you cannot remove only one. You need to start from above and start tearing them down. If you have 100 owners, you have a it's problem. A because if they all don't agree with each other, The other happens. problem, the pipes are in between the capsules. That is this side. So here. This is about... So the vertical ones are... You have this space, the lower ones you have this space, so it's impossible for maintenance. Your 
well, maybe my arm fits, but uh, you cannot uh, replace the pipes. So all the pipes are completely um, damaged. Um, so there are all these problems um, that started to appearing and making the building aging very fast. And as you can see now, the building is covered with a net. You probably can see this is a this is a metal, not a metal, uh, a net. A, a net because the capsules are getting so rotten, they are getting so old, they are starting to crumble. Pieces are falling, and the the year uh, we got there, one window fell on the street. No one got hurt, but this this was a gigantic issue. How can I mean? This doesn't mean that the 100 owners reached an agreement, but they understood that something needed to be done. And the short-term solution was to cover it with a net that every day, if you come here at the end of the day, on the bottom, you will see more and more and more we'll debris see. and debris and debris. And at night, this is the first time we went there. This was more or less what we saw. Uh, what is fascinating is that you have 132 capsules and you have around 8, 9 p.m., one, two, maybe. maybe this one is also, three of them with the light on, which means that the amount of users inside is very, very reduced. So when you have a building that is inefficient per se, and you have it 90% empty. empty, this becomes a, a double problem. And the three or four people that still live there, they are radical. They want to defend this building. They love this building. They want to keep it as it is. They want to restore it. They want to refurbish it. But they know nothing about construction. And they clearly don't understand the problems that these pathologies, the, the piping, the structure, the debris actually generate. There's not, it's not a matter of architecture, design, or typology. That's great. The Nakagin proved that it works and it's necessary. And actually, right now, in Tokyo, if you rent an apartment, uh, studio, you will get 10 square meters maximum. So it's not something completely different or completely new. It's a normal size for Tokyo. You can find, you can find this typology to be more common in Tokyo than, than you would imagine. As I said, in the beginning when we got to Tokyo, we were living in a cabinet. And if this kind of uh, smaller. shared housing uh, units where you just stack as much people as you can, you would sometimes be surprised. I mean, we were living in a space that was this size. I'm not kidding. I was sleeping in a diagonal because I wouldn't fit. This was, this was how dramatic it was. So when we went to the NAC again and we got to this size, it was an improvement because we had twice the amount of space, twice the amount of volume. And um, in here you can see, I mean, more or less several of the, of the these are the mailboxes. So everything, ah, this, is, this is something uh, I forgot to say. Kurukawa, Kurukawa didn't have that much time to plan it properly. So, and he knew it. Before he died, he even wrote a text about the fact that since the beginning that he knows that the project will fail because the capsules were never meant to be replaced. Because in theory, like all the metabolist movement, this was a metabolist project. But in reality, this was a very normal project built to look like a metabolist project. But he had fun. So all the details he could design, he designed uh, inside the apartment, everything. All the details are very, very careful and thought through. The mailboxes, as you can see, they are kind of metabolist cute. And, uh, and you would have even the numbering and the lettering and the, 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 the type, uh, how do you say, the, the font of the, of the, of the Nakagin was designed by Kurukawa, so, or Kurukawa's office. So, it, it's, it's a very hypocritical project in many ways. Like, there was no time to make it work, but it really, really looks good. And these are the common spaces. The, so the building is divided in two cores. Each core has an elevator. The elevator is not very big, but it can stand up to six people, maybe, four people. So, but it's, it's, it's comfortable. And around each one of these elevators, you have a spiral stair. Or not really a spiral. You have steps, landing, steps, landing, steps, landing. And in each one of the landings, you have two doors. So uh, the, the, the capsules actually grow up in a, in a, in a spiral. That's where this, this, this image where they become a little bit random uh, starts. But the space is so, so, so small that you end up just uh, using the, the outside spaces in the most creative ways possible. Some people had storage, some people had uh, bookshelves, some people you know, had uh, their laundry. Uh, but there were other things that were much more disturbing in these corridors. So the first one is the fact that you know, the, the, the capsules, they were just kind of 
glued <laughs> to the facade, to the, to the concrete core, I mean. So where they, where they touch, where they come together, there are leaks. And as you can see, the leaks come over the door and the water comes into these buckets. And when it rains, you need to spread those buckets. So the, one, the buckets inside the bucket, they go everywhere so that all the leaks are controlled. Otherwise, you just have the water going down the stair. You can also see that the, um, all the pipes had to be replaced. So you see the new pipes, the cold water pipes. The fact that there were only like 10 people living in the building meant that it's not enough people to replace the hot water pipes. So there's no hot water in the capsules. There's a common shower downstairs where the 10 people that live there, you go there, you mark your, the time that you want to take a shower, and you take a shower outside on the street. There's a cabinet. So if, if you Google, you will find photos of myself just with a towel on the sidewalk of Tokyo because you need to go out to take a shower, so I don't know if you can... There's a photo somewhere of this capsule on the sidewalk where people need to go to to take a shower. And it was part of the experience, but you can see the problem of the marketing. Ah, this one. This one. So, so this the door. cars, traffic on this side, people passing by all the time, we taking shower. And, but this, this is the real problem. So this is the, the first capsule. This is the capsule that is right after the, the, the ground floor. And since there's no capsule below it, you can see the amount of pipes and infrastructure it has. You can see the sewer exit, the water um, uh, that comes in system. Um, but you see the condition of these pipes. And these pipes were maintained. So these pipes had some sort of repair work along the time. Now imagine the 132 capsules that had no repair works in the last 40 years. You can, you can kind of speculate about the condition. Um, and some of the capsules, because of this, they got to this condition. So the pipes on the top get rotten, the water starts leaking in, there were asbestos on the walls, so there's no insulation. The walls are this thin, so if it's cold outside, it's cold inside. If it's hot outside, it's hot inside. Uh, and the condition is like this, so there's fungus, there's uh, mold, uh, mold, mold yes. everywhere. So it's not, it's, not, it's not nice. Not all the capsules are like this, I, I, I need to say, but you would have at least 30 to 40 percent of them in this condition. But other are not. So as I said, the few people that live there, they are, they are outstanding. They are, they are very passionate about the capsule and each one is a, has a specific characteristic that makes them weird and special <laughs> and all those things you can imagine that we as architects, okay, we, it's, like, it's a nice experience to live in a capsule. These guys have nothing to do with arch the architectural world. They just like the craziness of the building and they occupy each capsule in their own way. So through all the years, we were living in a quite original capsule, but most of the, uh, all the other capsules were... Uh, refurbished from the inside. Uh, and this is Kenzo. This is the guy who found us a capsule with a Porto wine bottle that we brought him uh, to thank him. He's amazing. Uh, he gets drunk every day, literally. Yes. <laughs> every so day. we met him just before he went down to get drunk. <laughs> um, and he works here, he sleeps here. His family is from a city like one hour from Tokyo, so he spends the Monday to Saturday is here, he, on Sunday he goes he to his family. So he's a fish broker, he has fish posters. So those are the orders and the calendars and you know the, the annotations for the purchases and selling and meetings. And then he has fish posters on the other walls. He has... And then at night he pulls the chair there, he takes the trash from there, he opens and he sleeps in the couch. So he's, he's absolutely amazing. And you might not believe it, but in this capsule, in this condition, we once had a party with eight people. Eight people inside the capsule. These are the Sekines. The Sekines are simultaneously the best and the worst inhabitants. They are the best because they are nostalgia uh, 
uh, freaks. They have everything from the Expo Zaka, like this lamp on her hand and those things in the corner, they are from the Expo Zaka. They have the original blankets, the original carpet, the original pillows, the original mattress. This TV is a new TV. It's a TV, a color TV bought, I don't know, two years ago. But the frame around the TV is from the original TV in the capsule that they kept so that it looks still the same. So it's not an original black and white TV, it's a new one, but it still looks the same. And it takes away like 10% of the image, but it doesn't matter. The important thing is that it looks original. They have one of the few clocks that still works, and they love the building. They, they are not from Tokyo, they are from... And they uh, don't live there, they just go, the, it's their weekend, weekend house. But they are the most radical defensors of the building. If there's a meeting with the remaining owners, they are the ones fighting for it to be preserved. And as I said, as long as one owner fights, nothing happens. Um, this is this is the, the this is the, the, the probably the, the the most out of out of topic inhabitant. She's nineteen. She knows she nothing about Kurukawa. I mean, she was at the time. Uh, she knows nothing about Kurukawa. She knows nothing about the capsule. Once she was moving to Tokyo, she just told her parents, I need to find a place to live. That one looks cool. I want to live there. That's it. <laughs> Forty years later, the Nakagin strategy still works out. This guy has the biggest plasma TV in the building, has a washing machine inside his capsule, has a printing... I mean, anything you need in the building, you go to him. He can take care of it. It's so cool. <laughs> this is the guy that had the clothes hanging in front of the door. Like, but he doesn't have a, a AC unit, which is the most important thing in this capsule. So he would spend almost all his time downstairs in the lobby because it was cooler or warmer, depending on the year. So he was a very weird guy also. But he is also one of the very proud uh, inhabitants. So if the tower is to come down, this guy is going to offer a fight until the end. This one, this one was an architect. Uh, he was work. Uh, I mean, urban uh, an urbanist. Uh, he was working in the municipality in the urban design uh, department, and he was the only inhabitant that completely understood what was going to happen to the building, and he was always not voting in these meetings. He just knew that he wants the building to last. He, he was the one saying it. I'm in love with this building, but I'm the only one inside that really understands that it's not possible. It's the problems are too severe. And it's so, too expensive to, to restore, to replace the capsule. So we went there this summer again, and he's actually not living there anymore. So the problems are moving and Growing. getting worse, and he's not there anymore. So it's one person more that went out. This guy... This was our neighbor, two doors after. And he was very weird. Is Yakuza, so first thing to know, is involved with the Mafia, and in his uh, capsule he owns two shops, a sex shop and a Hello Kitty shop. Uh, uh, not shop, but... Online, online, online shop, so you order a dildo, is the one that gets a dildo. It's, and the, the capsule is very, very weird, and he had this kind of altar, in, for example. only I could go in. Because she was a girl, she could not go there. But he had this kind of altar where there was a picture of his two daughters, they were like five or six, surrounded by sex toys. It was absolutely priceless. I could not take a picture of that one, but it's here. Uh, and, and he lives there, he works there, it's his warehouse, everything. Everything happens in those seven or eight square meters. This is my other son. He's, he's the second person who speaks English. Um, and he owned, when we met him, he owned four capsules, five capsules, and he had restored three of them. Uh, last summer we were there again, and now he has uh, 12. He's buying them, he's refurbishing them on the weekends, um, because he likes them. Sometimes he rents, sometimes he... It's just it's, it's his hobby. And because the building is in such a bad condition, he can manage to buy them and refurbish them quite cheaply. Uh, for example, the picture that we showed of the capsule completely in the water, he really read it. So I don't know what's behind those plastic walls, but the inside gets more or less clean. And it's, it's uh, so this guy is a, is a, has a kind of double personality. In a way, you understand what he's doing. He likes the building, and he, he assumes it. He's, 
a very he's very much in love with uh, the concept behind it, and he has fun with it. So as you can see, he brings natural wood floors. Which I mean, he brought solutions that you would find in a normal house to a capital. So that's that's kind of cute. But he's also he's also very smart because he knows the building is going to go down. The more capsules you own, the biggest the percentage of the profit you're going to get. So once the building goes down and they need to pay all the owners, he owns 12 capsules, which is about 10 percent. So 10 percent of the in the uh, uh, the, yes, of the funds that will be given to the owners, he's going to get 10% of it. And the more capsules he buys now at the cheapest price possible, the more money he's going to get. And in the meantime, he's renting them. And so if you, if you think about it, we were paying as a rent together uh, about 400 euros a month in a capsule. This is very cheap for Tokyo, very, very, very cheap. <coughs> but it was, I mean, it was a normal capsule, with a, it was not amazing. These guys now, they are renting Airbnb capsules, 100 euros each night. So you can imagine if you go to Tokyo now, you have the chance to live there, but you pay 100 euros. And 100 euros times, you know, an X amount of nights per month, this is a lot of money. So this became, as a start, this started as a, you know, a passion business, but this it's time, becoming a real business. Uh, the thing is, in the beginning, they were renting to Japanese people. Uh, when we were there, they were always asking, but why do you like this building it's in such bad condition? Why do you live here? And they started understanding this architecture world that we get in London and we do anything to just have the experience. So they are taking advantages of it. And now uh, a few more couples and, and a few friends of ours also live there after we left. Um, and they are renting it to foreigners. So now there are... Maybe, uh, I would say more, uh, if we, there might be more hope for the, um, uh, for the future of the neck in, in terms of amount of people living there, but at the same time, we know that unless they transform it in a museum and have enough money to, uh, to not preserve it, to replace the capsules and do all the works they have to do, they will have to do most. Because this renovation, they are just making, they, they are not solving any of the problems, they are just hiding the problems behind. There's still no hot water and there's still quite And this will come. So our capsule is more or less in a very good condition. The only exception is that we had um, an AC machine, but other than that, very the capsule important. was um, absolutely original. Uh, the capsule is very small, as you can see. Uh, there's pretty much one meter, one square meter between the door and the bed. So if you bring groceries, you start them right away. If you leave the groceries in the middle of the space, chaos. I mean, it's not possible to leave that. If you take a shower, there's not even enough wall space to hang towels. So you end up just using the available surfaces to put them. This table, this table here is where you used to work. Um, it disappears. So if you if you are just you know. Uh, moving around, the table needs to be closed. Otherwise, you can, you know, the, the square meter you have becomes half a square meter. So it's, it's really, 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 really tight. And uh, and these spaces, all all of the functions are somehow, uh, you know, Kurukawa was very careful with the design, the kind of light you have here, how you control it, how you can uh, open and close the table, how you have a space specifically for the phone and a space specifically for the typewriter at the time, now the computer. All, all the cables are hidden in such a way that if now you have a, a USB connection or any kind of thunder, uh, thunder port or how you call it, you have the space for it. So in 1972 this was taken care of. And I mean, but in the end it's still a very small space but it's very ergonomic. Uh, the bathroom, the same thing, you cannot see it, but this is the toilet. This is a, a circular space in the middle which is pretty much this is very small, but you can use the toilet, you can wash your face, you have the mirror here, here on the side, and you still have a complete bathtub. So you, it's not a shower, it's a bathtub. So everything is very ergonomic, but the key Japanese um, uh, needs were respected. And the size of the room is, uh, that's also funny. This seems like a very futuristic building, but the, the shape of the window is actually a, a, a direct reference to the Genkoan Temple in Kyoto. They have exactly the same window with the same size. The size of the available space in the capsule uh, comes from the minimum area necessary for a tea ceremony. So if you still wanted to have a tea ceremony, you could. So it was based on the amount of the tennis. 
the, the shower is not a shower, it's a bath because Japanese have a preference for a bath over the shower. So it's true that you have a lot of design issues, like the, the features, I mean like the, the, the circle is everywhere, the sink is a circle, the bathroom is a circle, the window is a circle, so there were a few obsessions from Kurokawa, but still, as modern as it may look like, it's a very conservative uh, space. And you can imagine this to be extremely high-tech, but the carpentry work, you know, all the cabinets, they are not this airplane-like technolog technological infrastructure, they are just wood. They are the most common and banal technology possible. They very futuristic, maybe, but not, not that much. And if you wanted to cook, if you wanted to do anything, even if it's just to have, you know, cereals, chaos, because you have only water on the bathroom, you, won't, you don't have, you only have a small fridge here, more like a frigo part. You don't have uh, any kind of box surface to, or a microwave or anything. So you need to buy portable devices. So you know, just we having could breakfast. stay in the bed without moving, and I'm not too dressed. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be impossible for me to move inside. So stuff like a, a kettle and a, a, a movable pot become the only option you have if you want to do something as simple as eating cereals. We didn't cook that much. It was only when we eat so much food. I, I, I truly love this image because uh, despite all the problems, despite the fact that Japanese and I hope there's none in the room are a little bit crazy and, yeah. and weird, very weird, but amazing people, uh, they, they all, the few people that live there, so these are most of them, they share a passion for the building that it's not common. And the Japanese are very detached, they, 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 they care very much about their careers, about their jobs, but they are in general quite quite free. And with this building, it's like if they are in love with someone. They they, 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 they respect this building in such a way that for example, we were living they, they knew this capsule. Everyone has pictures of all the capsules. So what we did was only new in the sense that we were not Japanese. But everyone that lives there knows all the capsules, knows who lives where, knows if someone had an AC unit they know it and like which kind of AC unit, which kind of curtain they have, they know everything. But because we were living there, and we were weird for them, they wanted to know how our capsule looked like. And the day we told them, please feel free to come in, they just took the, sh the shoes off, they jumped in our bed, they took pictures, they took measurements, they, you know, they just... You need to understand, the Japanese people don't invite other people to go to their homes. First, there's no space, so they don't invite, that's it. So, but when you say, of course, go in, then they feel completely free. There's no standard. So it was... This guy, this guy here, he was jumping on our bed because we told him like... the space is so small that we didn't find furniture that would fit. So since, an Anna, so since Anna was in the university, we had access to the workshop. We, we clearly we, we built our own furniture in such a way that we, it would fit to the millimeter. And then we didn't find a mattress that would fit. So we bought an air mattress that, well, it's an air mattress, so when you turn it on, it will fit to the space it has. So when we told the guys, they thought the idea was so genius that they wanted to test the resistance of the mattress. So they just jumped <laughs> <laughs> and, and it lasted. So it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was okay. And, and this is the community that lives there. This is the community that is making the building survive. This is the community that is fighting for it, but this is a community that, and now I need to, to play the devil's advocate, this is a community that has no idea of the danger the building is actually in. The structure, public health, health yes. So the fighting is, a, is dramatic. So you see the waterfall when someone flushes. flushes. So piping, asbestos, uh, the structure, the fact that some pieces are already falling, the fact that, uh, you know, the building is not meant to last. The metabolists, they were always saying that if a building lost its function, we tear it down and we replace it with a new one. So the only actual metabolist future, or the only actual metabolist gesture this building might have, other than looking like one, is to be replaced. This is not what I want. I, I, I truly, I, 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 I somehow believe that both me and Anna are part of this group of people who really love it. But when the building stops being what it should be, when, let's say, its soul is out, when 90% of the, build, the, the capsules are, are abandoned, rotten, leaking, when some little people live there, and we need to remember, this is a housing unit. 
the question is, does it make sense to preserve it in this kind of uh, zombie uh, uh, existence? Does it make sense to change its use and make a museum out of it? Because if a house stops being a house, does it make sense to just preserve it as such? And these people, they don't care. They know the problems exist. They are completely aware of them, even if they don't understand the, the actual consequences, but they fight for it. So, well, they are the reason why the Nakabini is still standing. Thank you. <laughs> Space to debate, study and celebrate architecture.